With Teeth was to be the last Nine Inch Nails album to be recorded at Trent's Nothing Studios in New Orleans, as in August 2005, Hurricane Katrina devastated the city. Already focusing his attention on outside issues, Reznor aimed his anger fully towards the United States government, who had been heavily criticized for not dealing with the disaster appropriately. I think after Katrina and during the Bush presidency, um, I think a lot changed, you know, in terms of the way he viewed the world. And I think a lot of the anger did become political. It became less of a personal thing. And I think that's, that's true of anyone who kicks drugs. You become less of a self-absorbed, self-pitying, inward-looking navel-gazer. I mean, he's, he, he doesn't have a political program. I mean, it is kind of quite unfocused, undirected anger, but it's a lot more articulate, unfocused, undirected anger. Um, particularly Year Zero, you know, I mean, it's not really specifically a protest album uh, about Bush or the war or Katrina, but there are elements there. Um, that's, we know that's what he's, what he's angry about. While Trent had been on the road touring with Nine Inch Nails, he'd been planning a new masterwork that would combine music and a concept that would get its potential audience involved from the beginning. Year Zero, released on April the 16th, 2007, was a concept album that presented a possible dystopian future set in 2022. However, the album was to become better known for the inventive and unusual way in which it was marketed, bringing many Nine Inch Nails fans into an immersive game of mystery and intrigue. Trent had always been into video games, of course he did work with the people who put out Quake. And he was really getting deep into these alternate reality games. Uh, games like Halo 2 and um, you know, Call of Duty and Myst and all that sort of stuff. And he thought, can we create an album that's part of an alternate reality? And this is where Year Zero began to be formed. We thought maybe do it with a couple of songs, or maybe we can do it as part of a larger thing. So with Year Zero, he got in touch with a company called 42 Entertainment, and 42 Entertainment was big into this sort of weird sort of uh, viral marketing, word of mouth kind of stuff. And they planned this very exhaustive, very comprehensive, very complex alternate reality game based around the concepts, the themes found on Year Zero. And if you study it, it is one of the, you know, Trent says it wasn't a marketing exercise. He says it was part of an artistic exercise, whatever. But if you study it, it is one of the greatest examples of uh, involving your fans in a mystery that just keeps getting deeper and deeper and deeper. And at the end, there's a payoff. First learning about the album, by the way, of course, was a surprise because what happened was everyone got used to the idea that, you know, Trent release an album and then go away for five years and then maybe release another album after that point. So just a year and a half after With Teeth comes out, more or less, all of a sudden he's saying, oh, by the way, there'll be a new album in two months. And everyone goes like, wait, what? A new album? <laughs> What's going on? Because that was the last thing anyone expected. There were more than 30 websites that were created for it. Uh, there were bathrooms seated with USB keys with mysterious songs and in some cases just static. But if you chose to examine the static, there were clues in the static. There were phone calls that you could make and get answering machines that sounded like there was a massacre in a nightclub. There was, um, you know, strange messages that you would get from sending notes to email addresses. It was an absolutely absolutely brilliant example of immersive gameplay. This is a message from the United States Bureau of Morality, pursuant to Statute 2412-2, Disclosure of Surveillance. Citizens, by calling this number, you and your family are implicitly pleading guilty to the consumption of anti-American media and have been flagged as potential militants. The United States Bureau of Morality has activated the tracking system embedded in your personal media and initiated citizen surveillance. I think if you look at uh, Trent, you know, through the history of Nine Inch Nails, he's always been very clever about marketing himself. You know, even taking it back to uh, the, the stage frenzies of uh, 
you know, the, 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 the stuff he was doing even before Downward Spiral on, on Pretty Hate Machine where he's knocking over microphones and smashing things and trashing keyboards. And, you know, he realized that uh, this presentation uh, would broaden his appeal. Year Zero is sort of less interesting, strange to say, as its own self-contained artistic achievement, and more interesting is sort of like, what if, what if you could take the idea of the album and turn to this bigger, more involved thing? It appeals to, it, 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 it appealed to me as the D&D the, the &D geek of the 1980s. It appealed to me as something that felt like something that should have been created in the 1980s. It felt like a very 1980s version of something dystopic, only it now was for this particular decade. In year zero, Trent Reznor got back to uh, doing what he did well, which is expressing what he felt. But instead of expressing feelings of, uh, you know, frustration and rage about upbringing and relationships and personal experience, popularity or whatever, he really looked at what was going on in the outside world and, you know, uh, uh, capitalism, consumerism, uh, you know, American society, the sort of gimme culture, uh, the gotcha media, wh whatever uh, it is, and, and just kind of expressing his uh, discontent outwardly and creating this album that's kind of a real soundscape of this, this kind of uh, uh, dystopia that he sees around him. You know, I think Year Zero articulates that quite, quite well. I don't think Year Zero is just the album, though. I'll, Year Zero is, is a lot of things that bleed off from the edge, like the whole campaign around it, you know, found uh, flash drives and clubs that contain, you know, links to websites that may or may not be the blogs of soldiers that have served in Iraq that have uncovered a conspiracy to, you know, have universal surveillance and whatnot, you know. Uh, you know, it, it was a, a fairly William Gibson-esque idea, you know, just bleeding the future off the edge of now. Um, and it's not quite science fiction, but it's not quite not science fiction. But it's very much him at the, the, the cutting edge of, of where musicians will be in the next decade. So I think what Trent's doing, what she did to an extent on Downward Spiral, is he sells worlds. He sells whole places to enter into. Sometimes these places are quite dark places, but it's a new, it's a new kind of art, I think, that he's in the process of creating. If he's making music in 10 years, it'll be amazing to see how he's doing it. Because with Year Zero, he was, you know, he, he said that he didn't even have a guitar when he was writing the songs. So everything was being done in a virtual world and quite possibly could be, you know, industrial music uh, 2.0. You know, it could be the, you know, there's a lot of bands out there now, um, Postal Service, which isn't the same kind of music, but most of that music is created in a computer. It's, you know, you have sequencers, you have two laptops, you're doing your thing. And Trent Reznor's not a dumb man. He, he's going to embrace that technology if he can. And it shows, you can hear it. On its release, Year Zero met with a mostly warm reception and peaked in the US charts at number two. The two singles spawned from the album, Survivalism and Capital G, both fared well. But it was the marketing campaign that had ignited the imagination of the audience, something that would clearly strike a chord with Reznor. The album also marked the end of Nail's relationship with Interscope Records. In October 2007, Reznor announced that he had fulfilled his commitments to the label and was going to be releasing his own material in future. From the very beginning, I think Trent has demonstrated the fact that he wants to be in total control of everything that he's done. When his contract with Interscope expired, he had two choices. Actually, he had three. The first was to re-sign with Interscope. Number two was to start a bidding war and sign with somebody else. Or number three was to try something completely different strike out on his own entirely and just get rid of the label system entirely. That's what he, he went with door number three. He went with that. He was very forward thinking. He uh, kind of looked at, around him and realized what was going on within the uh, music industry and uh, how many people were uh, downloading albums illegally and uh, how record sales were, were decreasing, you know, in, in an alarming way. 
And he said, well, hang on, I don't know if I want to be on a mainstream label that's going to try to take an active role in, in uh, my, my career musically and also is taking the lion's share of profits. So, you know, being a visionary sort of uh, a marketing person anyway, as he, as he revealed he could be with Year Zero and the way that he marketed that record or helped to create the allure for it and the demand for it, he, uh, he, he stepped outside and said, okay, you know, I'm going to take this bold move. And it was a bold move. Uh, you know, he said, okay, I can, I can market myself. I have this huge audience. I can present my music on my own and do it in a very DIY way, you know, sort of a do-it-yourself fashion. And what's interesting is the, uh, the DIY um, aesthetic is where he came from, you know, or, or at least where the artists that he valued came from. Trent was indeed embracing the original DIY culture that had begun with the early industrial movement. And in 2008, he began on this ambitious scheme, releasing two albums in the same year, Ghosts 1 to 4 and The Slip. Ghost is hands down one of the most revolutionary releases in any style of music. Um, you have somebody with the, with the recognition of, of Trent Reznor and Nine Inch Nails. He did something that no mainstream artist ever did by breaking ties with his label and then releasing an album absolutely free. He makes an announcement, he puts an album up, he says, okay, it's an all instrumental album, it, uh, it's this long, it would cover two CDs if you want to get the CD version, but here are all the options which you can get it. Here are the pricing schemes and here's how to get it. And he's here you can get some free tracks from it. And he does this strictly through his website and he just puts it out there and says, okay, here you go. And he does so including some insanely limited and insanely high priced for a lot of people, limited edition versions of the album as well. And in doing so, was able to uh, was able to make just an amazing amount of money. And it's one of those things that's sort of like, well, you shouldn't be only talking about money. It's like, no, I think you really should be. The stereotype right now is that the music industry is dying. There are very good reasons for this stereotype. Because what's happened is the, 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 the paradigm of the industry has now switched where everybody realizes no one's making any money on selling records anymore because at 99 cents a song you don't you're not forced to spend 18 dollars to buy a cd if you if you hear a song on the radio or you see it on tv you know you just go and boom 99 cents download you know and but it's hard to make it's hard to make a living and pay your rent at 99 cents a song you gotta sell a lot of songs because after apple takes a cut and the label takes a cut and the publisher takes a cut and the manager takes a cut you're left with not a whole heck of a lot per song the, the ghost album is a bit of a anomaly in the Nine Inch Nails catalog. It's peaceful and instrumental, mostly. There's no head like a hole, there's no closer. There's no happiness in slavery. There's, it, there's no capital G. It's, uh, it's an interesting record, and I think it's, it's, it's a pure artistic exercise in composition from Trent, because Trent is a, is a classically trained keyboard player. He wanted to see how far he could take it. And for sort of inexplicable reasons, maybe because he had such a, a, a diehard following, a loyal following, but his audience ate it up. And this this uh, album just sold through the roof. You know, this I, I believe it uh, netted well over a uh, million dollars. I, I think it's one point eight million. I don't know how much of that went into Trent's pocket, but certainly more of it went into his pocket than would have gone into his pocket had this record come out through uh, through a major label. And this is a very offbeat project for him. This was the least commercial thing that he'd ever done. So it was really a tremendous success. And. Uh, you know, for him to then put out his next album through the internet as well and say, well, hey, you know, you guys, I've done extremely well. Thank you for all the support. This one's on me. He creates the follow-up album to Ghost, which is more of a proper Nine Inch Nails record. There is a certain retro Nine Inch Nails element to the slip. Uh, it is more old school Nine Inch Nails than anything he's done for a while. Uh, I don't know why that is. Maybe he just recorded it quickly, uh, you know, as a thank you for everybody who bought the Ghosts record. Um, that being said, it's still a very good record. It's still very hooky. You can still dance to it. You can still slam dance to it. Um, I don't think Trent looks at it as a way of repeating himself. I think he looks at it as a way of, okay, let's strip things back. 
to where they were and rebuild from there going forward. The album he released is something that is still aiming for that fusion of styles and approaches that has become more and more his own specific one. And that can be seen in the fact that there was a song from it that actually became a radio hit that it was in America, and that was Discipline. That's a fascinating song for a very simple reason. It's the name of one of the most legendary Throbbing Gristle songs. It's almost sort of like, is it an homage back? Well, who can say? And so you can almost say it's sort of, it's sort of like you know, almost going back to the roots there, although it's not a cover of the song by any means. Instead, it's just using the idea. And it's a way of, again, playing around with those industrial tropes without specifically going back to and saying, like, hi, I'm still the king of industrial. It's more like, well, this is part of who I am. It's part of who I am. The slip is interesting because it feels like an encapsulation, almost a summary of where he's been beforehand. And why this is interesting is, is for this reason. Starting with Ghosts and then with the slip, he's done something that uh, is the equivalent of what one of his role models did back in the early 80s, that role model being Gary Newman. After uh, his huge period of pop success in England, eventually formed his own label and basically was marketing directly to his fan base, first and foremost. And he was able to make that last for a while, but that became almost too insular, and he's never sort of broken out of that since. What's interesting with what Trent Reznor is doing these days with this particular approach is that he could have done almost the same thing, and it's still early days yet. Who knows what will happen in the near future? If this is his full declaration of independence from the old system, if Ghost was the initial signpost, it's an interesting one to have because he's able to still create stuff that's still familiar and yet is still different from what's gone beforehand and still able to get radio airplay and still able to pack out arenas and do what he's been able to do. Ghosts 1 to 4 and The Slip proved to be massive successes not only commercially for Reznor and Nine Inch Nails but also for the new way in which they were distributed which was a radical departure from music industry norms. Since 1989, Trent Reznor has been creating music, painting worlds and mastering soundscapes that have entranced and enthralled his audience. He has emerged from the industrial music scene to become its most popular and recognized face. Trent went through some pretty dark times, and came out on the other side, very healthy, but determined never to let that happen to him again. So he wants to be as creative as he possibly can. This is a guy that does not want to sit still. This is a guy that does not want to repeat himself. He never has. And the thing that's driving him forward is himself. Where Trent is now in his career, he's in a position where he can do whatever he wants to with Nine Inch Nails. He's controlling his own creation. There's no one standing over him. Trent Reznor will be looked at in retrospect as being you know a groundbreaking forefather of american music in the late 20th early 21st century in many ways nine inch nails represent the end of industrial music however through experimenting with sound textures new technology and methods of distribution Reznor and several other artists still keep alive the traditions and ideology of an underground scene that was the angry voice of an alternative generation